In June 2021, a courtroom in Los Angeles, California stands silent as an elderly defendant is brought into the proceeding in a wheelchair. Frail and withered, this man looks hardly capable of committing the ghastly crimes he is accused of, but prosecutors allege that he has murdered multiple people over the span of several decades and has somehow managed to evade justice the entire time. Robert Durst was born on April 12, 1943, the oldest of four children to Seymour and Bernice Durst. His grandfather, Joseph Durst, was a New York real estate tycoon and head of the Durst organization, a company that owned millions and eventually billions of dollars of commercial and residential real estate throughout Manhattan. This meant Mr. Durst had what would be described as a very privileged upbringing. He and his siblings never wanted for anything and often got to enjoy the finest things life had to offer. However, Robert's safe and sheltered world was abruptly interrupted when he was seven years old. On November 8, 1950, Mrs. Durst climbed up to the roof of the family's estate in the late hours of the evening. A group of firefighters and policemen arrived on scene and tried to talk her down from the building, with one even successfully climbing a ladder and reaching the roof. Just before the rescue worker could make it over to her though, Bernice jumped and fell to her death. Now, reports at the time were conflicted, with some calling it a suicide and others referring to it as an accident. But in my opinion, it's pretty clear which one it was. Robert claims he was standing in the dining room with his father and was watching when his mother jumped. His brother Douglas, however, says this is a lie and that Robert was with him staying the night at a relative's house. As we'll see, this is just one in a long string of conflicts and disagreements agreements between the two brothers. Robert took his mother's death hard and was sent for psychiatric evaluation a couple years later at the age of 10. The psychiatrist concluded that Robert suffered from severe issues, specifically what was described as, quote, personality decomposition and possible schizophrenia. Unfortunately, it seems as though his father didn't put much stock in this evaluation, and from what I've been able to determine, nothing more came of it. Growing up, Durst was described by many as a loner. He didn't have many friends in high school and wasn't particularly social. After graduating, he attended Lehigh University in Pennsylvania, where he earned a bachelor's degree in economics. After leaving there, he enrolled in the doctoral program at UCLA, though he would end up withdrawing a short time later. It was at UCLA where he would meet someone that became a very close friend and prominent figure in Durst's life. Susan Berman. Susan was a student at UCLA pursuing a master's degree in journalism. More interesting, however, was her family background. Miss Berman was the daughter of Davy Berman, an infamous organized crime figure who was an associate of the Genovese crime family. Davy most prominently operated in Las Vegas, where he ran operations for Meyer Lansky and even took over Bugsy Siegel's management position at the Flamingo Hotel when Siegel was murdered in a gangland assassination. Davy died of a heart attack when Susan was just 12 years old, but for the rest of her life, Miss Berman would maintain a fascination with her father's criminal career. It was this career that inspired her to become an author and screenwriter. She wanted to make it in show business, and her dream was to go to Hollywood and write gangster movies, drawing from her childhood experience being the daughter of a man involved in organized crime. Her and Durst became very good friends, and would remain so for the rest of Susan's life, and she would become a close confidant of his during many of the troubled times that were awaiting him in the coming decades. After Robert left UCLA, he moved back to New York and became involved in his family's real estate business. 
However, he quickly decided it wasn't the life for him. As I said, Mr. Durst isn't a very social person, and as you can imagine, being a real estate mogul in Manhattan requires you to interact with people pretty much nonstop. Furthermore, Robert viewed his family's status and money as something of a double-edged sword. He believed that regardless of what he was able to achieve in life, nothing he did would truly be his own accomplishment due to the fact he came from such extreme wealth and privilege. Now, of course, he never went so far as to completely remove himself from his family's money, and would continue to take advantage of it for the rest of his life, so make of that what you will. But he did decide he didn't want to be involved in the family business anymore, and in the early 1970s he left the organization and moved to Vermont where he wanted to open a health food store. Not long after he moved, he met a young woman named Kathleen McCormick in the fall of 1971. Kathleen, or Kathy as she was more commonly referred to, was a medical student who was going through school to become a pediatrician. Her and Robert were immediately attracted to one another and began dating not long after. Things moved very quickly with the young couple, and after just two dates, Mr. Durst invited her to come live with him at his home in Vermont, an offer Kathy accepted. Robert and Kathy were a textbook example of opposites attracting. She was a very upbeat and outgoing person, while he was very introverted and socially awkward. At first, things were going great with the two. Kathy's family and friends described her as extremely happy and very much in love with Robert. Robert, but confessed that to them he was a little cold and distant. Regardless though, as long as Kathy was happy, they were happy. Sometime after the couple had moved in together, Robert's father Seymour asked him to come back to New York and retake his position within the family business. This was likely due to his grandfather retiring and falling into poor health, meaning Seymour, who would need to step in and fill in the leadership void, needed help. Robert reluctantly agreed to his father's request and sold his health food store. After moving back to New York, Kathy and Robert were married in Manhattan on April 12, 1973, Robert's 30th birthday. Things were going great in their relationship by all accounts, but underneath the smiles, laughter, and love, something unsettling was brewing, and over the course of the next decade, Kathy would begin to discover a very dark side to her husband. In the years following their wedding, the Durst slowly began to see cracks forming in their relationship. It started off slow with some mild fighting here and there, especially with regards to how Robert treated Kathy's family. He admittedly was never one for small talk, which always made attempts on his in-law's part to get to know him in vain. But after the two got married, things went to a whole new level, with Robert seemingly holding his wife's family in outright contempt. At family gatherings, he went from just being distant to almost going out of his way to be rude to Kathy's parents and siblings. Needless to say, she did not appreciate this, and her husband's attitude toward her family was often a source of conflict. By the mid-1970s, though, the couple would find themselves fighting over more than just that. In the span of a few short years, the two went from happily married to at each other's throats seemingly every other day. Things even started to get physical, with Robert hitting Kathy on several occasions during the course of these arguments. According to him, the domestic violence was a two-way street. However, by all accounts from people who knew the Durst's at the time, Kathy ended up getting the worst of it. By the late 1970s, the marital problems had become too much for her to bear. The couple privately separated, though publicly still remained married. At the time, the Durst's were living in a house in South Salem, New York, but this became more of a common house they would meet at on occasions after their separation. Robert began dating Prudence Farrow, a widely known transcendental meditation guru who was the sister of actress Mia Farrow, and subject of the song Dear Prudence, which was written by a small indie band a lot of you probably haven't heard of. He rented an apartment for the two in New York City, and would juggle his time between there and the marital house he shared with Kathy. 
Robert also purchased an apartment for his wife to use in Manhattan while she was attending the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Now living their lives mostly separate from each other, the Durst's relationship began smoothing over a bit, resulting in both Robert and Kathy being unwilling to officially declare the marriage over. By 1982, though, things had boiled back over between them. In January of that year, Robert and Kathy had a particularly bad fight, where Robert beat her so badly she had to go to the hospital and get treatment for facial bruising. For Kathy, this was the last straw. Over the years, she had been willing to deal with the abuse, either because she was too afraid to leave her husband for good, or because she was holding out hope he would change back to the man she first fell in love with. This is an unfortunately all too common occurrence among victims of domestic violence. Abusers almost never change their behavior, and the loving demeanor they show at the start of a relationship is typically a facade used to lure their significant other into a false sense of security. Kathy was finally coming to terms with this fact and asked Robert for an official divorce. Knowing they didn't have a prenuptial agreement and that her already violent husband would likely go through great lengths to protect his wealth, Kathy offered him a divorce settlement of just $250,000, basically pocket change to someone with his wealth. Robert, however, refused, and in retaliation for her even daring to ask, went out and canceled several of her bank accounts and credit cards. He further threatened to ruin Kathy financially, which would have put her in jeopardy of not finishing medical school just mere months before she was going to graduate. She backed down, and the couple went on with their current arrangement. And here is where it starts to become pretty clear that Robert was more interested in controlling his wife than anything else. Robert was already paying a substantial amount of money with three different houses and condos in his name. If that was the issue, then Kathy's offer would have actually saved him money in the long run. What he seemed to care about more was keeping Kathy under his control, and he made it very clear he had no qualms about threatening her livelihood or career she was working so hard for if she stepped out of line. This leverage he had over her would only last so long, though. Once his wife had become a pediatrician, she would be making more than enough to leave him, regardless of if he wanted her to or not. She only needed to go a little bit longer, and she could rid herself of her abusive husband forever. Tragically, though, Kathy would never make it to that moment. On the evening of January 31st, Kathy showed up to a party that was being thrown by a friend named Gilberta Najami. Her appearance was disheveled, and she seemed upset according to her friend and others that were attending. Sometime later that night, Robert called Miss Najami's house looking for Kathy, and after a brief phone conversation with her husband, she informed everyone she was leaving. As she was walking out the door, Kathy turned to her friend Gilberta and made a very haunting and ominous statement. She told her to promise that if something ever happened to her, she'd make sure her husband Robert was investigated. Miss Najami admits she didn't quite grasp the gravity of what Kathy was telling her at the time, but she promised her friend she would, and Kathy got into her car and drove off. It was the last time Gilberto would ever see Kathy again. A few days later, Miss Najami was supposed to meet her friend at a restaurant in New York City. However, Kathy was a no-show. This was very unlike her, and Gilberta immediately began calling around to their mutual friends to see if any of them had heard from her. She also called Robert Durst, who said he hadn't seen his wife since the night of the party, and was in the process of trying to get a hold of her himself. After several days passed with still no word from Kathy, Robert went to the New York Police Department and filed a missing persons report. 
He spoke with Detective Michael Strzok, who took down the report and got Robert's recollection of events. According to Mr. Durst, Kathy arrived home from Gilberta's and the two of them had dinner together. After they ate, Robert claimed that his wife wanted to go to the apartment near her medical school. So he drove her to nearby Catonia Station where she boarded a train headed for Manhattan. Mr. Durst said after that, he went over to a neighbor's house for a drink and later that night called Kathy from a payphone while he was taking his dog for a walk. His story was semi-confirmed by the doorman at Kathy's apartment building, who told police he'd seen her arrive that evening. The last person who spoke to Mrs. Durst was a professor at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, who Kathy had called on the morning of February 1st to inform him she wouldn't be able to make it to the first day of her pediatrics clerkship because she was feeling ill. After that conversation, the 29-year-old Mrs. Durst seemingly dropped off the face of the earth. The police took Robert's story at face value and simply chalked up Kathy's disappearance to a disgruntled wife who decided to run off on her husband, a narrative that they ran with basically the entire investigation. In fact, the New York Police Department seemed to exhibit no sense of urgency whatsoever in figuring out what happened to Kathy, even after Mr. Durst began acting very suspiciously in the following weeks. Robert wasn't contacting the police for updates, nor was he making any sort of public plea for Kathy's return, and he had basically disregarded her family and friends when they tried to contact him for information, which, needless to say, is not very typical of a worried husband. Also, despite being one of the most prominent families in New York, the Dursts kept almost entirely silent on the issue, and went so far as to even ignore requests from Kathy's family for assistance. No one within the Durst family outside of Robert was ever interviewed by police or volunteered to give a statement. What they did make sure to do almost immediately was hire an expensive defense attorney for Robert, a man named Nicholas Scapetta, who had previously worked as a DA for the state of New York and had very strong connections within the NYPD. He informed Detective Strzok that any further communication with his client client would be done through him, and after that, Mr. Durst basically cut all communication with the police investigating Kathy's disappearance. Additionally, the neighbor who Robert claimed he had a drink with told police this never happened, and he hadn't spoken to Mr. Durst at all that evening. You might think this would cause the NYPD to become suspicious and look more closely into Robert, but you would be mistaken. Even after being informed by Kathy's friends about the domestic abuse that had taken place and her very clear statements to them that she feared for her life, no effort was made to look into Robert's activities that night despite the fact he had blatantly lied to them. No searches were conducted of the Durst's home or the massive lake that sat behind it, no police dogs were brought in to search the woods around the home, and no further interviews were conducted with Robert. Gilberta and several other friends had become so frustrated with the lack of effort on the NYPD's part that they began to look into Mr. Durst themselves. A couple of weeks after the disappearance, Miss Najami and another one of Kathy's friends noticed Robert had taken several trash bags full of items out of the home. The two of them waited until later that evening, then retrieved the bags and took them back to Gilberta's house. They dumped the contents out onto her kitchen floor and began sifting through the items, which resulted in them immediately making a troubling discovery. Robert was throwing out all of his wife's belongings, her clothing, her medical school textbooks, and basically everything else she owned was getting tossed in the trash. Again, not exactly the normal behavior of a concerned husband who is hoping that his wife will come home. Even more chilling though, the women found a crumbled up note that had a list of items on it. These items included a shovel, trash bags, and a boat. To Kathy's friends, the meaning of the list was obvious. 
Robert had made a list of items one would need if they planned on disposing of a body. They brought this information to Detective Struck and the NYPD, who, as you would probably guess based on the pattern that has developed throughout this video, did absolutely nothing. Now, I'm not normally one to criticize police work in these videos. I recognize that detectives do not have an easy job, and it's really easy for us armchair investigators to sit in the comfort of our home and say what police should have done after the fact. But sometimes you have to call a spade a spade. Detective Michael Strzok and the NYPD conducted one of the most pathetic excuses for an investigation I have ever covered on this channel. They basically just threw their arms up in the air and walked away. Some of the decisions made throughout this investigation, such as making no attempt to speak with anyone involved in the Durst organization, were absolutely mind-blowing in their incompetence. This isn't just my opinion either. The New York District Attorney's Office, as well as other officers who would examine the case later, were very critical of Detective Strzok's work. For his part, the now retired officer has defended his investigation. He admits that in retrospect there were things he should have done differently, but says he didn't have much to work with at the time due to lack of evidence and being stonewalled by Robert's legal team. As bad as all of this was, however, information that would come out years later would make it all much worse. While the NYPD was conducting their investigation, the Durst family attorney, Nicholas Scapetta, was conducting an investigation of his own. He hired a private detective who had close to a dozen interviews with Robert, many of which Robert's father and brothers were present for. He also interviewed witnesses and other persons of interest with regards to Kathy's disappearance. At the time, his findings were not made public, nor were they made available to Detective Strzok and the NYPD. But several decades later, in the early 2010s, a copy of the report was obtained by HBO while they were in the process of making a miniseries about Durst called The Jinx, something we will be discussing much more in the next episode. And suffice to say, this report did not paint a very flattering picture of Robert. The investigator pointed out several inconsistencies in his stories, including the fact that he had changed his story three separate times during his interviews with the PI. He also discovered that the doorman at Kathy's apartment actually hadn't seen her enter the building that night, despite claims to the contrary when he was interviewed by police. This meant that the only piece of evidence showing Kathy had ever made it to the apartment was the phone call she placed to the professor at her medical school. But as we'll see, even that has fallen under a cloud of suspicion. When confronted with this information during his interview with HBO, Robert admitted he had fabricated his story about that night saying that the truth was after Kathy got on the train, he simply went home and went to bed. The reason he gave for lying multiple times was, and I cannot make this up, he just wanted the police to leave him alone and figured if he told them a story that sounded good, that would be the end of it and they wouldn't bother him anymore. And as crazy of an explanation as that sounds, the only thing that's more crazy is the fact it worked. Detectives struck in the NYPD basically trusted Robert Durst's word throughout the entire course of the investigation, even after his neighbor told them Robert's version of events was false. This has led to rampant speculation that the NYPD was paid off by Durst's family and involved in some kind of cover-up to make Kathy's story go away, which personally I don't agree with. The state itself has never fully dropped Kathy's case, and as we'll see, the district attorney's office has been very aggressive in their investigation of Robert in the years since. I think the explanation is much more simple. There's an old principle in philosophy called Hanlon's Razor that states, never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by stupidity. 
In this case though, I would swap out the word stupidity for laziness. Simply put, it seems to me that the NYPD just did not feel like investigating this case. Was it because they were intimidated by the prospect of getting one of the city's most powerful families involved? Or was it because they were overwhelmed by an admittedly heavy workload and just never had the energy to pursue it like they should? Regardless of the reason, the tragic fact is Kathy was the one who paid the price. To this day, her body still has not been recovered, and her family has never received any closure regarding her disappearance. As one would imagine, in the months and years after Kathy went missing, speculation in the New York press about what happened and Robert's role in events ran rampant. As a result, Mr. Durst quickly found himself running out of allies within his personal circle of friends and associates. His family may have held up a strong front for him in public, but in private they had begun to distance themselves from him. One person who demonstrated an unshakable loyalty to Robert throughout the entire ordeal, however, was Susan Berman. Susan had maintained a close friendship with Robert since they both left UCLA, and remained a loyal friend throughout the entirety of his marriage to Kathy. Miss Berman stayed by Mr. Durst's side throughout the entirety of his wife's disappearance, and functioned as something of a press secretary for him. Throughout the 70s and 80s, she had worked at New York Magazine and Cosmopolitan, giving her a lot of connections within the New York press and a thorough knowledge of how they worked. When tabloids and other news publications would try to contact Robert, Susan would be the one who would answer them. Any comments or statements Mr. Durst would have in regards to a news story would be relayed to the reporter by Susan. Her closeness with Robert and willingness to jump to his defense at any given opportunity has led to some speculation that she may have had some involvement in Kathy's disappearance. Most notably, some have theorized that the call placed to Kathy's professor, which is widely considered to be the last time anyone actually spoke with her, was actually Susan. The professor admitted later that he didn't know Kathy well enough to recognize her voice. And if the now widely accepted theory that Mrs. Durst had never made it to her apartment is true, someone with a female voice had to have placed that phone call. This of course has never been proven, but it is an interesting theory. And as it would turn out, what Susan Berman did or did not know regarding Kathy's disappearance was soon going to become a very important topic of discussion. As the investigation into his wife's disappearance turned cold and her name faded from the headlines, Robert resumed his life working at the Durst organization, though a rift slowly began forming between him and the rest of his family throughout the 1980s. Robert's father Seymour was getting older, and would soon be stepping down from his position running the organization. Robert, despite always saying he didn't like working in real estate, assumed he would be the one to step in and take his father's place since he was the eldest son. However, as the decade came to a close, it was becoming increasingly obvious to everyone within the organization's inner circle that his younger brother Douglas was going to be taking Seymour's place. This infuriated Robert, who had always had an acrimonious relationship with his little brother. To him, this was Douglas stealing his birthright. The fact that Robert himself had admitted numerous times that he didn't enjoy working in real estate was irrelevant. He wasn't going to have it taken from him. In 1992, Seymour retired and officially appointed Douglas as the head of the Durst organization, and Robert immediately reacted. He filed a lawsuit against the company and his brother, seeking his share of the family fortune, resulting in a bitter legal battle that would continue for over a decade. Susan, on the other hand, had continued having a relatively successful career in journalism throughout the 1980s, 
but eventually left to start focusing more on screenwriting. She was briefly married from 1984 to 1986, but her husband passed away from a heroin overdose. While trying to get her career in film and television off the ground, she wrote several novels with a strong focus on organized crime in Las Vegas. These got her by for a time, but by the late 1990s, she was dealing with severe financial issues, and by 2000 was holding on by a thread. She was now renting a small home in Benedict, California, a suburb of Los Angeles, and was working on several projects at the time which she hoped would get her back on her feet. This included a series for Showtime called Sin City, which was supposed to be the answer to rival HBO's hit series The Sopranos. Throughout this time, she borrowed upwards of $50,000 from Robert to keep her living situation afloat. Though it is not believed this affected their friendship, Mr. Durst would soon have a new set of problems to worry about. In 1999, the New York Police Department had secretly reopened the investigation into Kathy's disappearance, sparked by a tip from a confidential informant who claimed to have heard Robert killed Kathy, dismembered her body, and disposed of her remains in the lake out back of the couple's home. This time around, the charge was led by an ambitious district attorney by the name of Janine Pirro, who had been openly critical of how the NYPD handled the initial investigation into Mrs. Durst's disappearance. Searches were conducted on the house that Kathy and Robert had shared, which had since been sold to a new owner. Searches were also done on the lake out back of the house, but unfortunately this didn't yield any new evidence. Not to be deterred, investigators began looking into Robert's personal circle and seeing if there was anyone who might have some information. This led them to focus on Susan Berman, and by November of 2000, it was announced to the public that the case was reopened. The New York District Attorney's Office made several attempts to contact Susan throughout that year before publicly announcing the investigation was back underway. Up to that point, Miss Berman hadn't agreed to speak with them. However, it is speculated that toward the end of the year, Susan had agreed to meet with the New York DA's office. What it is she might have told them though is unknown, because she would never get the chance. Thank you for joining us for the first episode of our two-part series on Robert Durst. I'm sorry to leave you guys hanging here, but we felt it was better to split this up instead of making one long video. So join us in two weeks when we explore the next part of this insane story. If you want to support our channel, feel free to sign up for our Patreon, where you'll receive ad-free early access to our videos, as well as behind the scenes updates on what we have planned. And as always, if you are interested in true crime, criminal justice history, or mysterious stories from around the world, feel free to hit that subscribe button so you can be updated whenever we post something new. This is Crime Spot, and thank you for watching.